This video is supported by Translatebox. A great property of Haskell is that it is a purely functional language, which enables us to theoretically construct proofs for all of our Haskell programs. In the last two videos, we took a look at these proofs in the form of induction and termination proofs. And we have seen that we can prove important aspects of our programs. But we have also seen its downsides. Proofs take a long time to construct, not just the formalization of program behavior, but the actual steps in proving statements is a time-consuming endeavor. Another problem we face is that in our proofs, we operate in a mathematical realm, which is simply not the same realm as Haskell, or any program language for that matter, lives in. So we need a way of interfacing these two domains for our proofs to be correct. Lastly, we never know if we have formalized the proof correctly. How do we know that our steps are correct? After all, we are only humans. These problems are addressed by proof assistants, also sometimes referred to as interactive theorem provers. A proof assistant does the boring parts of the proof, like rewriting terms or applying lemmas, for us. We only have to tell the assistant how to do the proof. Instead of worrying how to go from Haskell to proof, we do it the other way around and generate Haskell code from our theorems in a verified manner. Proof assistants are not just passive rule rewriting engines. They check whether our proofs are correct according to their own meta logic. A proof assistant will not let us do any nonsensical steps or invalid applications of theorems. And that is why in this video we want to take a look at Isabel. Isabel is a theorem prover that can be used for purely mathematical proofs, using set or number theory for example, but also has its own notion of a programming language with HAL, which is short for higher order logic. We will see later where this language took a lot of inspiration from. In addition to helping us with the simple parts of our proofs, Isabel is capable of using automatic reasoning to construct parts of our proofs for us, which can save us a lot of time, of course. The aforementioned language Hall can be used to generate verified code in all kinds of functional programming languages, Haskell being one of them. If you want to see what kind of proofs are possible with this assistant, you can take a look at the archive of formal proofs, a huge collection of Isabel proofs for all sorts of theorems from mathematics and computer science. A link is in the description below. Isabel is not just a purely theoretical project. It was used to verify the secure embedded L4 microkernel, making it the first formally verified kernel in the world. Okay. Now we want to go into Isabel and actually look at how we would construct proofs for our programs. So here we are in Isabel. Just before we start, I want to uh, well get the point across that this is not a tutorial on how to use Isabel. And this is also not a class on the basics of Isabel. This is just a showcase of what is possible in Isabel, what we can do with functional programming, uh, and specifically purely functional programming, and why it is so important to talk about the theoretical aspects of Haskell, because it is very important for program verification, and that is something that I want to showcase here. If you want to, well, really dive deep into Isabel and prove things for yourself, there is documentation on everything in the program itself. So you can just, you know, open some PDFs here and get documentation on various subjects in Isabel. Okay. So here we are in a new file. I've called it intro.theory. And in Isabel, in order to do anything, you have to start a theory with the same name as your file. Also, you should import certain things. In our case, we will import main, which will give us access to data types like lists, for example, uh, and also give us some theorems that we can already use uh, for proving. Okay. So what do we want to do? Well, let's program. And why not 
uh, use the same example that we have already used in the video on induction proofs, where we proved that the length function is equivalent to fold r with a const of plus one. So, okay, let's write the length function first, because we cannot be sure that it already exists in main and we want to use our own implementation anyways. Okay, so let's start. Uh, you define a function with the fun keyword. And now the syntax might look a bit weird at first, but that is just how this language looks. And let's take a look at this. So every function has, of course, a type signature. This is very similar to how Haskell works. Now, types and also expressions uh, for, for those functions have to be put in double quotes. This is a bit weird. It, it looks a bit strange, but that's just how it works. So what we say here is that we will define a function length with the type a list to natural numbers. Of course, that makes sense. Uh, you know, integers make no sense for the length uh, function. Natural numbers make much more sense. Also, type variables have to be written with this prime, with this single quote in front of it. So in Haskell, it would be a list or, well, a in brackets and here it is prime a list but that's just you know that's just syntax now we can define uh, well defining equalities for this function because now the question is how is this function defined well we can use uh, it's very similar to how um, Haskell works we can use uh, pattern matching here so we can for example say this, you know, and this is already a finished definition. Of course, it is partial, right? Uh, and also Isabel tells us here that we have a missing pattern. But this is so important, uh, you know, for me to, to explain this, that this is a defining equality, this thing. That means that every time you encounter length of an empty list, that is equivalent to zero. And every zero is equivalent to the length of the empty list. And that is only possible because this language, just like Haskell, is purely functional. If it weren't, you know, if, if the language wasn't purely functional, then this wouldn't work. Uh, so that is one of the very important reasons why Haskell um, is purely functional and why that is so cool. Okay, so let's define another uh, definition. Well, the rest of our definition, we need to have another pattern, which also looks very similar to how it looks in Haskell. Uh, the prepend operator or cons operator now looks like this. Again, this is just syntax. Uh, we have to get used to it. And then the final definition looks like this. Also, uh, between patterns, between definitions, you need to have this vertical line here. That is just how it works. And now we've done it. We have written our length function. Isn't it cool? Okay, so let's, well, let's evaluate it, right? Let's, let's try to do something with this function. We can do this by writing value and then, you know, having some expression that we want to evaluate. So maybe length of a list one, two, three. And it tells you now that, well, the term to be evaluated contains free dictionaries. What does that mean? Well, basically we can solve this by uh, giving one of the elements in this list a type. That is the important thing. If we don't do that, then um, Isabel has problems inferring the types. So we do it like this and we get three. And that makes sense for a list that has three elements. Let's maybe add uh, some other elements too. Whoops. Okay. And that should be seven. Yeah, that's okay. So our length function is correct. Great. Okay. So let's define a fold R. So fold R is a function uh, that of course takes another function as an argument. So in this case, we have uh, a to b to b. Another important thing might be, and you might have already realized that uh, this is a strange symbol. Where's this symbol coming from? Well, Isabel uses many fancy symbols that we can, uh, you know, take a look at here with the symbols tab. So here are many, many symbols and letters and stuff like that, that we can use for our proofs. And this is 
not just syntax. Like, for example, a union for sets has the semantics of being a union for sets, right? So this really is like writing down a mathematical proof. The nice thing is that um, Isabel will check, of course, that we don't use a union on a list, for example, because that makes no sense. But funnily enough, there is a way of translating lists to sets and then doing the proofs there. But we might see this later. Okay, so let's uh, finish the definition of fold R. It looks, again, very similar to how it would look in uh, Haskell. Uh, whoops, now I made a little mistake. Okay, and then it is B. Okay, so this is the uh, type for fold R. So let's define fold R. Fold R for some F and some uh, Z with the empty list is just this set, the accumulator, and um, now the other definition for fold R with some element in that list would be that it is F of X. Ah, whoops, <laughs> that was the wrong symbol there. Um, F of X of F, Z, X, S. So, okay, that is our fold R. Something you might have already realized or might have read is that Isabel found a termination order. What does that mean? Well, Isabel, every time we define a function, it tries to find a measurement for which it is possible to prove the termination for, and it then simply does it. So also for the length function, it, well, has proven that this function terminates. How did it do it? Well, it used the list length measurement. Now, that might be a bit strange, right? Didn't we just define length? Yeah, that's true, but I said that, well, we are importing main and main is importing list and there already exists a length function in it. But the important thing is that you can prove um, the termination just like we did it in our termination proofs video by finding a function that um, is descending and that hits some lower bound. And that is exactly what is true for uh, the length function for this argument here. Now with fold right, it simply takes a look at this uh, list, which of course gets smaller every time we have this uh, recursive call here. The list that we um, supply to fold R gets smaller, and of course, uh, we hit a lower bound, which is, well, the list of length zero. So that is really cool, isn't it? Because now we have two functions and we already know that they terminate. And that is also something that I said in my termination uh, proofs video, where I said, well, we need to prove termination in order to prove anything else. And well, that is exactly what Isabel is doing for us. Now think about the, the amount of work we had to put in in order to prove that functions terminate. And here it is simply given to us uh, just for free. But we will take a look at an example where this doesn't work anymore. Okay, but now we also have to define another function, which is the const function, right? Because we now want to, uh, well, replicate this proof from uh, my induction proof video. Okay, so how does uh, const uh, look like? It looks like this, where we have uh, two arguments, and of course, one of them is dropped. Whoops, okay, like this. So we have an A and B, and we simply return the A. Of course, here, the termination order was found, well, <laughs> in a simple manner, because there is no recursion here. So yes, of course, it just terminates. That's, that's uh, a given. Okay, and now we have written three functions and now we want to prove that uh, the lemma um, that I've talked about in my video actually holds. So now we define a new lemma and that should look like this. Length of XS has to be the same thing as fold R of const. Now the question is, how do we write an anonymous function? Well, uh, the cool thing is there is a lambda symbol in um, in hall and it works just like you would expect, right? So it works like this where you say, well, we have an X and 
x plus one, that is the anonymous function that, you know, represents the plus one. Right, and it has to be the same with zero and xs. That is the thing that we want to prove. And that was the thing that I have proven in my induction uh, proofs video. Okay, so what is actually written down here? Well, what we are saying is that for an arbitrary excess, meaning for every excess imaginable, this equality has to hold. That is what we're saying here. And also, you know, uh, the, the cool thing is, Isabel, that's where the theorem, uh, you know, interactive theorem proving part comes in. Um, Isabel now tells us, well, you haven't proved this and there is still, you know, a proof goal. We still have one sub goal, which would be, well, the whole proof, right? <laughs> that's, that's what we still have to do. Okay, so let's do that. How did we prove uh, this statement in my video? Well, we did it with induction on lists. And that is possible in, um, in Isabel in a very easy manner. So we basically say apply. We now tell Isabel to apply some proof rule or some proving technique. And we say, well, please do an induction on XS. And now, as you can see, we have two sub goals because remember how induction worked, right? We have to do the base case, which is this. Then we assume an induction hypothesis, which is this. Intro length XS is the same, you know, with XS. So here we see the base case is done for the empty list. Here the induction hypothesis is valid for XS. And then we prove the whole thing for an arbitrary A XS. Okay, interesting. So how do we prove it? How do we actually do it? Well, there are some um, automatic proving techniques that Isabel can do. One of them is called auto. And well, let's check if auto actually does something here. And when we apply auto, as we can see here, we have no sub goals anymore. What does that mean? Well, it means we are done. We can now close this lemma with the done keyword and there we have it. We have proven this theorem. It is that easy. Now think about it, what we had to do, how many steps we had to take uh, when we were proving this theorem in my video and how long it took to do the proof. And now all of this, well, has been given to us just like that. That is crazy. Now, this is a imperative way of doing proofs. We will see a declarative approach later, but this is done very often with induction proofs because many induction proofs are actually as simple as that. Uh, just using, well, the right variable to do an induction on and using auto is often enough to prove such equalities. And because that is done so often, there is a nicer syntax for that. What you can actually do is you can tell Isabel, well, this is proven by doing an induction access and then using auto. And this is just, you know, a shorthand for what we have seen right there. Uh, and this by induction access auto very often works, uh, which is which is cool, right? That that is really cool. OK, so again, Let's recap what we did here. We have proven the termination for three functions, length, fold, r, and const, and we have proven this equality. Really cool. Okay, we did another proof in that video, and that was a computation induction on this splice function. Uh, let's just, you know, let's just write this function again. The splice function was a function that took two lists and basically, you know, spliced them together. So uh, with two empty lists, we simply had the empty list splice, whoops, splice. Okay, that way splice with uh, one list simply returns that list. The same thing goes for this. And now the interesting thing is what if both lists have at least uh, one element? That will be the 
important question. And here what splice does is it first takes an element of the first list, then uh, an element of the second list, and then uh, continues recursively. Okay, and even here, even in this function, it already found a termination order. Even though this function really is a bit more complicated, right? Because here we have two lists and we're doing some strange stuff. Isabel just found uh, the, the uh, well, termination order for this function. So yeah, we have already proven that splice uh, terminates. Really cool. Yeah, and then we also had a sum function this sum function now we want to just define it for integer lists right we could define it for more more general lists you know numeric uh, lists for example because isabel actually has a notion of type classes uh, but we're not going to use them here uh, we are simply doing this on integer uh, lists for now okay so we define the sum function like you know we would. Uh, of course, we could do it with fold r. That would also be possible. Or we could prove that fold r with plus and zero is the same as sum. We could also do that, um, but we we don't have to, uh, of course. But that might be a fun exercise for for the viewer if uh, you really want to you know go down the Isabel route, uh, right? Okay, so what was the lemma that we have proven in my video? That was the following. Uh, it was that sum of splice of any XS YS is the same as the sum of XS plus the sum of YS. Right? That intuitively makes sense because we never change what the elements in our list is when doing a splice, so the sum should be the same. Before we do the uh, proof on this function, we have to ask the question, well, we want to do a computation induction, but how do we actually do that? Well, we know that we can infer the patterns for a computation induction from the function itself. And actually, Isabel does that automatically in the background. Now, let's take a look at that. How do we do that? Well, we go into this query tab here. And when we're here, we check that we have context, cases, terms, and theorems all, you know, checked. We just want to have the whole output, everything uh, we, we, well, can see, we want to see. And now we search for splice and click apply. And here we are, well, we are still in the lemma, right? We are still here in the lemma, which is why the only thing that we can see is this thesis. But let's go outside of the lemma. Let's click here on the splice, for example, and do the search again. And now, my God, we have some stuff uh, to look at. And what is all of this? Well, the first interesting thing uh, might be the simplifications that we have here, mostly called sims. And the simplifications are very easy. They basically tell us that, well, an empty list is equivalent to this. And this is equivalent to an empty list, right? And for any arbitrary V and VA, this equality also holds. So those simplifications are really just rewriting rules. That is everything that that, that is, right? And there is an internal uh, command called simp, which will use these simplifications that we have here. Right, we also have some other stuff, but the in interesting thing, the really interesting thing is the induct rule. And now if you take a look at this, right, what do we have here? What, what does all of that mean? Well, we basically say that if we have some property for the empty lists, for two empty lists, and for all VA, we have this property of the empty list and uh, whatever, you know, this this uh, prepending of V and VA, this basically this list consisting of these two. And, right, uh, that implies that we have the same thing for the list and the empty list. And now let's just, you know, take a look at how this is actually defined. This basically is what the induction, uh, the computation induction is, right? That is the computation induction, what this induct rule tells us. And this induct rule is automatically inferred, 
not just for the splice, but also for length, const, fold r, length, uh, so, so everything. Uh, I think I said length twice, but okay, whatever. So every function that we have, the computation induction rules are already there and we can already use them. Again, we can use this induct here, which is our computation induction. Okay, so how do we do it, right? How how do we actually uh, make a proof with computation induction? Well, uh, it is done by applying induction, of course, on both arguments, xs and ys. But now we can specify a rule. And the rule we want to specify is splice induct. And now, once this has been, well, has been used, we can see our computation induction unfolding. This is the computation induction we've talked about, right? First we do it for the empty lists and then we will have all of these cases. Great, right? And if we go back to our query, right, and maybe not search for splice but search for nothing basically, then we have another interesting thing. We have different cases that we need to prove. Those are the different goals that we have. And look here what we have here. Well, first of all, for these functions, we have no um, recursive call. So there is no induction hypothesis in these cases, right? Uh, because that's how computation induction works. Only the last step has a recursive call which is, of course, the, uh, the recursive call to, um, uh, well, let's, let's take a look at it, the recursive call splice xs ys, right? That is our recursive call. And here we can see that automatically it assumes this induction hypothesis, which is, of course, the induction hypothesis we need to use. So, yes, Isabel here correctly does a computation induction, just like we did it. Okay, so here we are. That is what we need to do. And here we have four proof goals. Well, <laughs> who would have guessed that a simple auto actually proves all of them? Yes, uh, you've seen correctly, right? And done, right? We're done. We have proven that splice xs ys uh, well, the sum of splice xs ys is the same as sum x, uh, xs plus sum ys. Again, we can use uh, the more concise uh, syntax for this by saying by induction xs ys with the rule auto, and then we're done. So think of what we just did. We have defined functions, we have proven their termination. Well, Isabel has done that for us, but we simply said, well, thank you, Isabel. Uh, and then we have proven the theorems that we've already seen in my previous uh, videos with induction, simply by telling Isabel, ah, oh, please do an induction, please do that for me. And it did it. It is quite amazing how that works. Okay we have seen how easy it can be to do induction proofs. Now we want to take a look at a case where this isn't as easy. So here we have two reverse functions. Um, the first reverse function is a very naive implementation using append, which of course isn't that great. And then we have a, well, slightly more sophisticated approach using an accumulator. Okay. So these are the two uh, functions we have and what we want to prove is that they are equivalent if the accumulator for the accumulator version of this function uh, actually uses uh, the uh, empty list. Okay, so if we try to do an induction and say, hey, please do an induction on this and we apply auto to it, it fails. Well, it doesn't really fail. It just tells us that there is one sub goal left and this sub goal looks like this, right? This is the sub goal that we have. And I find the sub goal very important. So I'll just copy it because we will need it for later. Trust me. So I'll just copy it here and write it down. This is where we basically fail because now if we try to do done, right? It says, no, you have failed to finish the proof. We are not done yet. Okay, so let's see how we can prove this. And we want to do it in a, in a very, very like meticulous way where we do a step-by-step -step proof. 
And in order to do that, we will use the declarative proving approach in Isabel, which is actually the preferred way of doing things. That is called ESAR, which is a proving language, basically. So let's take a look at it. You open such a proof with the proof keyword and we say, well, what we want to do is an induction on XS. And already um, it tells us that, well, if I hover over proof, it tells us that there is a proof outline for this. And the proof outline is now the, well, the template for doing this proof, basically. So here we have the induction, uh, the, the induction base right? The base case where we do it for the empty list. And here we have the induction step where we have this. This is our induction hypothesis. And uh, well, what we are trying to, uh, to prove is that, well, assuming this, right, the induction hypothesis, we want to prove this case for a list with the cons uh, operator or cons constructor or whatever. Okay, so let's do it. Let's try to prove both cases. Now, when we don't really know how to prove something, because how would we prove this? I don't know. Um, in that case, we can use the try zero keyword. And try zero now tells us, well, um, of all the like basic proving techniques that Isabel has, there are some that are able to prove this. So let's maybe use uh, simp by simp. And it actually makes sense that simp is able to, uh, to, to prove this. Why? Well, what are we trying to prove? We are trying to prove that a ref ag of uh, two empty lists is the same as ref of empty list. Well, just look at the definitions. Ref ag of an empty list with some accumulator is the accumulator, the empty list in our case. And ref of the empty list is the empty list. So yeah, both simplify to the empty list. So both are equal. Okay, so simp did that and that is really nice. Uh, but we know that try zero will fail here, right? There is no proof found for this case because, well, we have no idea how to do it and we know that auto already failed. So that's not really nice. Let's try to do it ourselves with a step-by-step -step proof. So what we want to prove is this equality. So let's maybe do that step by step. And we can do this with the have keyword. The have keyword now tells us that uh, we want to specify uh, exactly what kind of facts we have about our term. And, when, uh, and what we want to do is a step by step rewriting of uh, the, the terms that we have here. Okay, so what is ref of a XS. Well, let's look at the definition here and it should be this, right? This is the case that matches. So this is also the definition for, uh, f well, for what this evaluates to. So this is the term that we have now. And how do we prove this? Well, we can use a try zero again and it tells us, well, there are many ways of doing this, but sim can do it. Of course, because this is just a simplification, right? Let's go down to our query here and uh, let's search what we have for ref. And we see that in the simplifications right here, we have exactly that. So that is what sim uses basically. Okay, so let's go back. Let's go to the output and let's uh, prove this further. So what we want to do now is also have and then use the dots. What does that mean? Well, that means that the right hand side we had before is now the left hand side here, right? So it would be the same as using this and just copying it uh, where the well three dots are. And that is how we can do this step by step rewriting. Okay, so what we can do here is use the induction hypothesis, right? So the induction hypothesis says that ref of XS is the same as ref ag XS of the empty list. And that is exactly what we have here. So let's use it, right? Ref ag of XS with the empty list and then of course appended with the A. And let's try to prove that. And it tells us that, well, <laughs> there is no proof found. What? That makes no sense because our induction hypothesis tells us so. So what is going on? Well, we have to tell Isabel to use the induction hypothesis. So how do we refer to it, uh, to it? Well, let's go back to query. Let's search for what we have here, what the context is we're in. And we see that down here, the induction hypothesis, 
which is this fact, is called cons.ih. That is simply what uh, this thing is called. So, okay, cons.ih it is. So we tell Isabel, please use cons.ih and now try to do the proof. Try zero and we see there are many ways of doing it. Again, simp can actually do this fine. Okay, nice. So, what do we do now? And that is an important question because what is the next step to take? Well, let's maybe look uh, at this problem from the other way around. Let's look at what we could do with refact, right? Uh, so, what could we do with that? Well, let's say we have this and well what do we simplify to well let's again look at the definition and we could use this definition it actually is the only definition that would work so we have to use it um, but okay that's fine so this is basically that right this is refac xs with a and the empty list by the way we can actually simplify that right here to uh, the list just containing the a and then also we can get rid of the brackets now let's do the proof and we can do it with simp again okay very nice and now we are at the interesting point where well if we want to if we want to actually well finish this proof we need a way of taking this term and rewriting it to this term. Now, we have seen this before. This is exactly where auto failed. So auto did all of these steps we've just talked about by itself and failed at exactly this point. Isn't that crazy? Well, okay, let's try to do this because again we are humans right we are not auto we can do this well hopefully so what is going wrong here why can wh why can't we do this uh well rewriting here what's the problem well it is simple we have no way of further rewriting this ref act here we could rewrite it back to whatever we have here but there is no other way of doing it why because well, the pattern matching tells us we either have an empty list or we have this XXS. And well, in our case, we have the problem that this XS is arbitrary now. It is fixed, but it is arbitrary. And that means it could be the empty list or it could be a list with 100 elements. We simply don't know. But what we well need to do, what, what would be beneficial for us, is if we would have some lemma telling us that if there are elements here in the accumulator, then we can actually just append them to whatever this is with the empty list, right? Because that is essentially what we are trying to do here. Now, the problem that we are facing right now is that our induction hypothesis makes no assumptions about a general accumulator. That is the main problem we have here. As you can see, the induction hypothesis only talks about an empty list. And also our proving goal only talks about an empty list. But now, and that's just a coincidence basically, um, we have the problem that we are at a point where, well, we have a non-empty list, we have something else. So that is the point where we need another lemma that helps us in proving this. And that lemma is also sometimes referred to as a generalization of an accumulator, right? That's what we are trying to do. We are trying to make a proof that generalizes this accumulator and makes a general statement about a general accumulator. Okay, so uh, let's do that. Let's write another lemma. Um, so this, of course, isn't proven right now. We simply say sorry and tell Isabel, well, sorry, we can't prove this right now. Uh, we'll do it another day. Okay, so let's create a new lemma. And what we want to make is a statement about refac with an access and an arbitrary accumulator, right? And now we have to think about, well, what is this term? What does it rewrite to? And well, it sort of makes sense that it should be this, 
it is the same as having refxs with the empty list and then with the accumulator appended to it right and the brackets written like this why is this clear why should this be well because the accumulator when we look at this case is used at the end of wherever we prepend this xs to right so the elements of xs get prepended to this accumulator so if the accumulator was empty and we still want to have the same result, we have to append whatever was in the accumulator without changing, uh, you know, we don't have to reverse it or anything because that's also not happening here. So this should be true. Well, hopefully. Okay, but how do we prove this? Well, we have to do an induction again. And now the question is, well, but on what argument? And the argument will be XS. We can see this because we need to do a case distinction, right, for XS. And this case distinction is essentially what is happening in ref ag here, right, in this pattern matching. So an induction on XS is in order. Induction XS. Okay, so we have a proof outline again. And, uh, well, we, we actually start another induction proof now just for proving uh, this other case. But before we do that, we should check that our lemma actually makes sense. So let's give this lemma a name. I call it ref ag gen, just for a generalization, right? And I say, well, we have this. So let's try to do our proof, right? Let's uh, try to finish this proof and say, well, also have... Whatever we have on the right hand side here should be the same as having um, ref of ag xs with the a here using our newly found lemma here, ref ag gen. Let's do a try zero. And yes, there is a solver that can actually solve it called Metis. Um, what it actually does internally, I'm not even that sure. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm not really sure what it does, but hey, that's just uh, how it is. And now, and that's the cool thing, we can actually uh, finish this proof and say, well, okay, also have that this is the same as ref xs of uh, no, that this is the same as ref xs of the empty list with an a xs. And this should be uh, provable by simp again. Yes, it is. And now we can say, okay, so now we have proven that ref of a xs is the same as ref ag of a xs with the, with the empty uh, list, which is exactly what we wanted to prove for this induction step. So now we can say, finally we have that this on the left-hand side is the same as the right-hand side. And we can prove this um, by blast. Blast is the one that is able to prove this. And now the proof for the case simply falls in our hand again by simp. And ta-da! We have used this newly found uh, lemma in order to prove uh, the whole, well, the whole thing we wanted to prove, the whole theorem that these two functions are the same. Okay, but again, we have a problem. This has not been proven yet, right? We have uh, these sorries here. So we need to prove this lemma in order for this lemma to be, um, well, to be uh, okay. Okay, so let's do that, right? Let's start by proving the base case uh, that is well usually done by simp because the base case is always very easy to do. So let's go into here and here we have some funny things going on, but let's see what's happening. And an important thing right now is, uh, or like something uh, important that we need to take a look at is uh, what is happening um, to our induction hypothesis for this case, right? So let's look at the induction hypothesis and this isn't correct uh, just wait we need to do right we needed to do an apply okay so let's look at our induction hypothesis and we see that this ag here is blue well what what does that mean well that basically means that ag is not arbitrary anymore this is this is a fixed ag that is the same for everything that we talk about here 
Like every egg that we have here is the same. And that actually is a problem. That is a problem that will occur when we try to use the induction hypothesis because there will come the point where we actually need to work with this accumulator somehow. So we need to make it arbitrary. We need a way of saying, Isabel, please use an arbitrary accumulator. And that can be done in two ways. Either you add it to the lemma, right? And you say for all ACK, do something, right? Uh, oh, right, sorry, I needed to use the for all uh, symbol here. For all ack, do something, right? And now it is green. But if we again look at the context here and we print the context, we see that everything now that we do is automatically done for all ack, right? So now it has been generalized. But this is an ugly way of doing it. The nicer way of doing it is by telling Isabel that you want to do an induction with an arbitrary egg in this case. And now when we uh, look at, at what we have here, they are arbitrary. They are now whatever they might be, right? We don't really care what they are. They are not fixed. They they are something. Well, they are fixed. And that is the important thing. They are fixed for the cases, right? So here we have fix ACK and here we have fix AXS ACK. But why is that fixed? What does that mean? That means that this induction hypothesis, when it talks about this ACK, and here we all also have the statement for all accumulators, um, it actually talks about the same accumulator. So this is just, you know, we want to have a general accumulator here in order to even use the induction hypothesis. Uh, that is just something that we have to do. But okay, let's um, let's actually try to prove whatever we want to prove here, and that looks like this: ref ac of a x s ac is the same as ref ac a x s with well this statement here. Okay, so let's do the same thing that we did before, where we did a step by step proof of this. Uh, yeah, a a simple step by step proof of uh, well this uh, rewriting here. So let's do it. Again, we need to check what uh, kind of, oh, wait, uh, I've used the, I think I've used the wrong, yeah, this should be ACK, I've used the wrong uh, term here. So uh, we have this term and what do we want to rewrite it to? Well, there is only one way of doing it, right? There is only this way of doing it. Uh, so we have to use it with an A. And of course, this can be done by simp, of course. Okay. And now let's look at how to further simplify this term. So we have ref ag of xs with a and x. So let's maybe see what our induction hypothesis tells us, right? And what our induction hypothesis tells us is that for any accumulator, if we have this term here, we can rewrite it to this, right? For any accumulator. This is why it was needed to have this arbitrary. And I'll show why this is needed in a second, or I'll demonstrate that otherwise it wouldn't work. So here we can actually use the uh, induction hypothesis. We can actually use this uh, rewriting rule here. So we can say this is the same as having A and ACK here, right? Using the induction hypothesis again, let's see which one can do it. Blast can do it. Okay, so let's do it. Simp in this case couldn't do it, but Blast can. Okay, that's really, f that's fine. I mean, I don't really care which one of them does it. So, and where do we go from here? Well, we actually have a way of using this induction hypothesis again if we rewrite what this means. So what does that even mean? Having an A and prepending it to an accumulator. Well, it basically is the same thing as saying that we want to actually append it to ACK if this A is enclosed in a list. So it is actually the same as having this bracketing around uh, these terms. And again, let's just, you know, do a try zero and actually auto can do this for us. It can do the rewriting. So that's really fine. And here's a point where we can actually use this induction hypothesis again, right? So let's do that. 
we will use this induction hypothesis again by saying this is the same as having the a right here in uh, in our in our accumulator so let's use a try zero of course we have to use the induction hypothesis again do a try zero and metis can do it again thank you for that okay so now we're at this point and well now we are well already done right because now we have the a here and by doing this step in reverse we get to a point where we have the following we have whoops we have uh, the dots we have refac and now a and xs with the empty list with an appended accumulator try zero should well auto can do it okay and now we are done actually because if we look at we wanted to uh, at what we wanted to prove this is the term that we wanted to end up uh, at so now we can say finally 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 i mean it took long enough but finally we have that this well whatever this is is equivalent to this I think blast should oh wait I have a I have a yeah there was a bracket too much so actually blast can do it and that means that the case should also be provable by blast and that is the case so now we have not only done this arbitrary like uh, generalization of the accumulator with an arbitrary accumulator but now we have finally proven that this lemma holds. Now, I know what you might say. Well, this is a hell of a lot writing for just one proof, and you might be correct, but think about it. If we had done this with pen and paper, first of all, we had the same, or like we would have the same problems of writing down all of these rewritings, right? But the other thing is that Isabel is able to prove that every step we did here was correct every single step and that is a really cool thing okay so i still wanted to show you that uh, it doesn't work without having an arbitrary accumulator so let's let's well show that if we don't use the arbitrary accumulator then the induction hypotheses here are not uh, well are not applicable anymore Right? Because here we have this, well, we have this arbitrary accumulator which is not fixed anymore for our case. That is actually the problem that we have here, that this accumulator is not fixed for the case. So now, again, I've showed you that you can use for all in order to repair this, right? And in this case, actually, yes, the induction hypothesis works again, but then this end step here doesn't work. Now, I want to show you what to do in this case, because now if we use try zero, actually there is no proof found. And that is a bit weird, right? Because here we have in the finally have, we have what we wanted to prove. So why isn't this working? This is just strange. And in this case, you can, well, do a brute force approach and use Sledgehammer. And I've talked about how Isabel has automatic reasoning and automatic proof, uh, well, automatic provers. And yeah, they are now firing when using Sledgehammer. They are, well, working in the background uh, for a minute. Uh, and they are just, you know, trying to brute force uh, a solution. And in this case, this solution was found using a few rules, um, that we didn't, well, that we didn't have before, but Sledgehammer did it anyways. So yeah, I guess that is really cool. But again, well, this is all a bit ugly. Also the for all here is a bit ugly. So let's just remove that again, right? Our proof was much better when we had the arbitrary accumulator, which had a fixed accumulator then for this case. Well, it's not really fixed, but it's, it's a general for the induction hypothesis. Right, so now we've seen a lot of proofs uh, and well, why stop there? We still have some other subjects to talk about. Okay, now that we have seen induction proofs, let's talk about termination.
Because there are functions for which Isabel is not able to prove that they terminate and we have to do it ourselves. Okay, so let's look at this function. This is just a factorial, right? Uh, and every, every function here is defined on natural numbers. So going from zero to infinity. Okay, so this is the factorial and here we have another function which uses the factorial in its definition. So what does this function do? It has three natural numbers, a, b, and c. If a is smaller or equal to b, then c is returned. Else, we have a recursive call. So, it only terminates if at some point a is smaller or equals to b. That is the important thing about this function. Let's look at how a and b evolve over time. Well, a stays constant and b just gets bigger because it is b plus the factorial of b. And we of course know that uh, any factorial is always bigger than zero. And c is simply incremented, so we don't really care for c. But the problem is that Isabel, when removing the sorry here, is not able to prove the termination. It cannot prove it. So that's a problem. We have to do it ourselves. So let's do it. First of all, we need to prove that uh, the patterns are complete. Now in this case we don't have any patterns, but we still have to do it. So we do this by pat completeness auto. Isabel just does it. It checks if if all the uh, if all the patterns are correctly um, well if all the patterns are complete. It, again, in this case, we don't have any patterns. We just have a case distinction, which is fine always. But now the important thing is that we need to prove termination for f. And you might remember from my last video that for this we need an evaluation function, sometimes called a measurement function. And this function needs to get smaller with every recursive call and then hit a certain uh, lower bound. And that is exactly what we want to define now. So how do we define it? Well, we need to apply a rule, which is the relation rule. And for this rule, we tell Isabel that we want to have a measurement function, which, well, how should that look like? So we have the arguments a, b, and c, but what should be the evaluation function for this? Well, since a needs to be smaller than b in order for this function to terminate and a is constant and b is just getting bigger, the difference of a and b actually suffices here. Okay, so this is the measurement function we want to use. So here we, uh, we have some, you know, more abstract goal that we can simply uh, get rid of with auto and we end up with this sub goal, which should prove the following thing. For all a, b, where a is actually bigger than b, prove that a minus b plus factorial of b uh, is smaller than a minus b. Okay, so how do we prove that? Well, we could of, call, uh, of course start a new ESAR proof, but we are lazy, we don't want to do that. And we simply want to use Sledgehammer for this. Okay, so let's invoke Sledgehammer and let's, you know, hammer away. And as you can see, there is nothing popping up. Because actually, Sledgehammer should not be able to find this proof. It should not be able to, to prove this correctly. Why is that the case? Well, let's remove Sledgehammer again. We see that here we have the factorial function. What is known about the factorial? Well, nothing. Because we have not proven any, any lemmas for the factorial. So there is nothing to say about this function. So there are no rules that Sledgehammer or any you know, rule, uh, uh, any, any technique here could use in order to do some simplification on this. So we need to find our own lemma. So something that intuition tells us is that um, the minimal value of the factorial is one, right? That is something that uh, intuition tells us. So the factorial of any n should always be bigger than zero. And let's try to prove that with an induction, which actually you can just write as induct. And let's apply auto to it and it can be proven. Okay, nice. So let's write that down in a, in a nicer syntax, which we have seen before. 
by induct uh, n auto. So this is our little lemma that we now know about the factorial. Let's call it factorial min. And let's say, okay, let's use this new fact and let's now use sledgehammer because now we have a way of talking about the minimal value that um, that the factorial needs to have. And actually, it is provable very easily simply by simp, which uses this rule. So uh, pressing control and then clicking on this uh, should well, point us to what rule this is, and it is this rule. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, if m is smaller than n uh, and m is smaller than l, then l minus n uh, is smaller than l minus m. Okay, so that rule, which is just, you know, it's just present in Isabel, that was now used by the simplification using uh, the, well, minimal value we have for the factorial in order to prove its termination. And here we are actually done. You might remember that in the termination proofs that we did manually, we also, you know, did some argumentation where we said, well, if this number is zero, then it means that this number has to be smaller and blah, 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 all of this stuff. But it was never proven really that what we are doing makes sense. Here in Isabel, we know that it makes sense because all of the theories that Isabel has about algebra, about how numbers work, are proven. This is not just stuff that is hard-coded into Isabel where we say, yeah, that's just how it works. Isabel has a very minimal meta logic and everything that Isabel knows is derived from this very minimal set and yeah, everything that we use here is actually proven. This diff less mono 2 is a proven fact. So the termination of this function is now also a proven fact. Great. And just as a little as a little side note, I uh, actually made another proof for uh, the factorial, which proves that if uh, n is bigger than 2, then the factorial of n is always strictly bigger than n itself. Okay, so how do we prove that? And for that, there is another proving technique that you can use uh, in order, well, in order to do your proof. And let's look at that. It is the obtain keyword. Because sometimes you want to say that, okay, if in this case we are in the induction step, and actually, uh, we are talking about a successor of a, you know, of some number n, then it should be possible to obtain an m where the following thing holds. And the following thing is that m plus 3 equals the successor of n. So why should that be the case? Well, we know that because here we have a premise, we have a assumption. The premise is that n is bigger than 2. So this means that the successor of n should be, well, at least 3. So there has to be an m for uh, which it is true, whoops, for which it is true that it is the same as the successor of n if we add 3 to this m. And we can now use this newly found uh, variable, you know, which has to exist. We can use it for our argument, uh, argumentation here, where actually we don't just show equalities, but we show inequalities, as you can see here. And yes, Isabel even knows how to work with these inequalities. And it can use, you know, all its knowledge on algebra. And also here we have another, um, here we have another little uh, theorem about, about uh, equalities. And it can use all of this background theory that it has on mathematics in this proof on a programming language, right? Because the factorial that we've defined here is, is a program. And we are proving a program now with the knowledge that we have on, uh, on numbers, basically. Yeah, right. And this, as you can see, is a finished proof. It proves that uh, the factorial of n is indeed larger than n if n is bigger than 2. Right, so this is just uh, a little bonus that we have here. So, 
we have seen induction on lists and we have seen induction on numerical values and we have seen how to prove uh, termination. Now let's look at one last thing, which is how do we prove certain things for other data types, like for example, a tree here. Here we have a very basic definition of a binary tree, very similar to how we uh, would do it in Haskell. And here we have a few functions. So the first function is the insert function, which inserts a value into the binary tree, uh, of course, in a sorted manner. So if the value um, that we want to insert is smaller or equals to the current value of the current node, then we insert it into the left subtree, otherwise the right subtree. Then we have a mirror function, which basically mirrors a tree. Then we have a from list, which does the following. It uh, goes through a list and does an insert on, uh, well, with this X on a recursive tree here. So it basically takes a list, which actually is in the, uh, has a linear order to it, right? It is in the, in the sort of type class of linear orders. And it takes a list of these elements here uh, and transforms it into a tree. Okay. Um, also, we have an in order traversal of a tree, which uh, generates a, a list from a tree by doing an in order traversal. And then we have a lot of stuff which we will talk about in a second. And what we want to prove in the end uh, is this that actually um, an in order traversal from um, uh, in, in order traversal in a tree, which was created with this from list function for, uh, for an arbitrary list is actually sorted. That is what we want to prove. So sorted is just a function that is present in uh, Isabel in order to uh, say that, well, a list has to be sorted. So that is what we want to prove, right? Before we go into all of this, uh, that is what we want to prove. So let's think about how to do that. We might want to do an induction. And we talked about uh, induction in my induction proofs video, where I also said that this structural induction is possible on trees, on graphs, and whatever else. And that's what we are proving right now, or not really proving, we are showing that this is possible. So let's maybe try to prove that mirror of mirror T is the same as T, right? So mirror, what does it? It mirrors a tree. So mirror, mirroring a tree twice should, well, basically be the identity. That is what we are trying to show here. So let's do an induction on this tree, right? Uh, so let's say proof induct T. And let's see what Isabel comes up with. And Isabel actually infers the correct way of doing an, a structural induction on a tree, right? Because here we have the two, um, the two uh, constructors. We have the leaf, which is our base case, and we have the node, which of course uh, is the case where we have induction hypotheses for the left and the right subtree right? Because those are the recursive uh, data types or like recursive types in this case. Um, and that is how the structural induction should work on a tree. So let's see how Isabel does it. So it basically tells us, well, okay, for this proof, we have um, the base case where mirror mirror leaf has to be leaf. This is actually very simple. It is done by auto or by simp, but that's not important. Um, and then it says, well, for every T1, X2 and T, uh, T2, we have uh, this. First of all, mirror, mirror T1 is T1. Mirror, mirror T2 is T2. And now we have to prove that mirror, mirror of the node of T1, X2, T2 is the node T1, X2, T2, right? So this still has to be the same with the two induction hypotheses that the left and the right subtree, uh, well, that this proving goal is valid for those two subtrees. Right, and actually, uh, in this case, this is this is really trivial. We can just do a, a try zero and see. Well, <laughs> auto can actually uh, do it. What I wanted to show here is that if we if we query this again, 
right? We actually see that um, this infers, or that that uh, Isabel is is capable of inferring the right hypotheses, right? In this uh, case, it's called uh, hips, I guess, uh, which are those two rules here. Okay, so using this knowledge, let's uh, try to do some fancier stuff. What we want to prove is that sorted uh, of in order from list XS is true. So again, what this means is what we want to prove is that if we do an in order traversal in a tree, then uh, which was created from list XS, then this list again has to be sorted, right? That's what we want to prove. So um, basically what we want to show is that an in order traversal in a tree will always be uh, sorted. That's what we are trying to prove here. Okay, so let's do that. How do we do it? Well, uh, for this, we need a little lemma and that lemma should tell us, uh, should tell us this, that a sorted tree um, if a tree is sorted, then inserting a value into it still results in a sorted tree. That is the lemma that we want to prove. And for this, we have two abbreviations. So basically, um, sorted of in order of some tree, we now call sorted t. So what we uh, define, well, what we want to say is that a sorted tree is then is sorted only if the in order traversal is sorted, right? And then we also have this set t, and set t uh, is a set of the in order traversal of t. So set is just a function that um, transforms a list into a set. And what do we need that for? Well, we have some additional lemmas here uh, that we need for the proof. So the first thing uh, would be this sorted t value sets, which uh, means this. So if a tree is sorted and the tree consists of uh, a node with L, V, R, right? So the this tree is non-empty, it is not the leaf, then uh, it's true that for all values from the left subtree, those values are smaller or equal to uh, this value, which we have here for the current node. And the same is true for the right subtree, but only that the values have to be uh, larger or equal uh, to this current value, right? And we use the, we use the set transformations in order to use this mathematical notation for all elements within a certain set, right? That is the that is the important thing. And here we have a little proof doing this. Here we have another proof, uh, which uses, again, another syntax. Um, so if you have a lot of assumptions like this in your lemma, you can actually write them down like this as a little list. And what we, uh, what I'm saying here is that, well, if all the values uh, in the left subtree are smaller or equal to V, and uh, if all the values in the right subtree are larger, and the left and the right subtrees are already sorted, then this uh, here, this sort of in order traversal is also sorted, right? This in order L, uh, in order L um, appended with V appended with in order R, that is also sorted. And that is actually shown really quickly just using the assumptions. Um, so that is uh, not really, well, that interesting. Um, Right, then we also have a lemma uh, called sorted node. What that does is that if a tree is sorted and the tree consists, you know, is, is non-empty and it consists of a node with a left and a right subtree, then of course the subtrees are also sorted. <laughs> of course, that is that is trivial. And then we have maybe the easiest lemma of them all, which is that, uh, of course, if you insert a value into a tree that, and take a set from that, then it's the same as taking the set of this uh, tree and have a union with the set just containing this vo uh, one value. And now we can take a look at the actual lemma that we need. This is the lemma sorted insert, which proves that inserting into a sorted tree is still a sorted tree. And here we actually do a uh, computation uh, induction on the insert function. 
Okay, and so what do we do? Well, let's look at the insert function again. Here we uh, have these two cases, right? We use the computation induction in order to have these um, these uh, recursive calls, insert VL and insert VR as uh, induction hypotheses. But the problem that we face is that we have this case distinction with an if, and that is something that we have to handle. So. Again, the, uh, in uh, the, the base case is actually very easy, right? It's just done by simplification. Okay, that's nice. Um, what we are trying uh, to prove here is that uh, indeed the left and the right subtree that we have for this uh, case are sorted, right? We use the sorted node for this, uh, which was, you know, the proof that the subtrees are sorted. So here we have the fact that both of them are sorted, I guess. And we have this important fact, which um, basically means, and it is basically the same as the sorted T value set uh, lemma uh, already told us, uh, especially that the values in the left subtree are smaller or equals to uh, the, the uh, current value that we have. And the same goes for the right uh, subtree, uh, which, which, have which has larger values than um, our, our current value. And now we can do a case distinction. So now we do a proof within a proof where we say now we do a case distinction on exactly this. If V is smaller or equals to TV, because that is exactly what our if tells us here, right? So we now do this case distinction and we say it, no matter w uh, which one of these two, uh, you know, definitions we use, we still have a sorted tree. And here we don't do much, actually. Uh, we basically prove that, well, I just need to check up on that, what it means. Uh, yeah, first of all, uh, we show that how the insert behaves. So in this case, the insert, for example, inserts into the left subtree. Here we show that <clears throat> it inserts into the right subtree. And then we show uh, that all the values that are in these subtrees uh, are still smaller or bigger than uh, our current value. And that together with uh, some other stuff shows, uh, especially like the induction hypotheses, shows that uh, both cases are correct. Right. And that uh, is it. So that was a bit more of an involved proof uh, with more stuff going on and also using set theory within our proof here. So let's just remind ourselves what we are doing here, right? We are um, having some data type that we could define this way in Haskell. Then we define what it means to have a sorted tree. So it's just sorted in order traversal of the tree. And then we use set theory in order to prove that our tree is actually sorted, right? And we do this uh, conversion from a programming language to mathematics with the functions that are already proven within Isabel. Okay, so now we have successfully proven that if we create a tree uh, with the from list function and do an in order traversal of that, it is a sorted list. So we could use this as a sorting function, couldn't we? But for that, we need to have the Haskell code exported from Hall, because this is not Haskell what we're doing here. This is higher order logic. So let's do the export. And that couldn't be simpler in Isabel. So what we do is, well, we use the export code, um, the export code keyword. Now we tell Isabel uh, what kind of functions we want to export. So in our case, it is insert from list and in order. And now we tell it that, hey, we want to create Haskell code. And not only that, we want to have a special module name, which we will call sorted tree. It doesn't really make that much sense, but that's what we are going to call it. So now it tells us, hey, see theory exports. And if we click on it, we have an export right here. And if we click on that, we see that we are within a Haskell file, a Haskell file, which defines its own class for, uh, for ordered values, right? Then has some, has some other stuff. So in this case, it just does some rewriting. This is all done automatically. I know that it doesn't make that much sense, but that's just what's happening here. 
And here we have our functions, which are now ready to be used. And that is the great thing about Isabel, because now we know that this code that we have here, by the way, it uses the native implementations of lists from Haskell. So now we know that when we use a list, which satisfies this lin order here, which we would need to, uh, which we would need to define for our data types like ints and natural numbers and stuff like that. But after we have done all of that, then we know that these functions here are correct. There is no doubt anymore. There is no, well, maybe it works, or I have tested it on a hundred test cases. That stuff is out of the window because now we have a proof for it. And this proof tells us we are done here. That there are no more assumptions. The only assumption that we make is that Haskell, the Haskell compiler is correct and that our computer does correct things and doesn't do you know weird stuff. But otherwise, we are done. And that is what program verification is all about. Program verification is not about showing that uh, a certain thing uh, can happen or uh, certain things might work. It is about showing that they definitely work, no matter what. So that should be it with our excursion into program verification, because now we are at a point where we actually can use verified code in our programs. Before I close this video, I want to talk about the difference between testing and verifying. Now, some videos ago, we've talked about quick check. And I personally think that quick check is very important for the Haskell programmer because it makes us think about how to formalize a specification for our programs. And that is something that I personally think every programmer should do and not enough programmers actually do. Most programmers do not really think about a formal specification when they write a program. They just know what it should do based on examples and then try to implement something that, well, fits these examples. But that's not really how we should think about the correctness of a program. It's about a formalized specification. Quick check is cool because it makes us actually uh, create these specifications, right? It lets us create properties that we can then test on our programs. And to be quite honest, for non-critical code, so code that uh, we are, well, we don't really care that it's 100% correct, you know, a test is fine. Just using some testing data and letting some examples run, that is fine for code. The problem comes when we have code that needs to be correct. Or if we have abstract things like a protocol, a cryptographic protocol maybe, that needs to be correct. That is a point where we need to start formalizing specifications. And those specifications, again, this for example is a specification, those can be proven in a proof assistant like Isabel. And that is why it is so important for us as programmers, be it functional or imperative, that's, that's really um, no matter. But it is very important for us as programmers to think about how we could prove a formalized specification, which is why I think it is important for programmers to at least once take a look at how to prove program correctness and what it means to verify a program. Well, luckily, we did that today. Okay, so that is it. If there are any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching.